And so thank you guys for having us. Thanks for watching our video here. And we have an amazing lineup of panelists. All of them are mentors and friends of mine. I'm Dr. Brooke. I'm the owner dentist of Your Special Smiles and Dr. Costin, one of your instructors. I met her through affiliations with the American Dental Association. And she said, you know, I think that you guys should get with our special care club and do some presentations. And I thought, you know, it would be great is to get a whole bunch of diverse people from diverse backgrounds that that practice geriatric dentistry, all of them just a little bit different so that you can hear various perspectives. And, and that's what we've done is I've assembled a panel of people that I see as experts across the nation. Um, so my personal friends and my personal mentors. And so I just wanna share their wisdom with you. Um, in so doing, you guys have submitted questions and we're gonna go through all 11 of your questions that you guys submitted. Each question will have two answers to it and each panelist will have two minutes per answer. I've got my fancy timer here. And so you'll hear the panelist answer and you will have the questions here. So we'll just go ahead and get started with our questions. And the first question that was submitted is, when do you justify placing silver diamine fluoride and watching decay over extractions, implants, root canal, or crown? And the first person we have to answer is Dr. Sam. So go ahead, Dr. Sam, you have got two minutes. All right, greetings, everybody. I'm Sam Swetchkamam, I'm from Rhode Island. I will first say that I am currently working in state government, primarily doing uh, policy, advocacy, a bunch of stuff. So I'm not actually doing a lot of clinical work, but so when you hear me talk in the past, that's what it means. So the two things, and, and I'll, I'll say I had a mobile dental practice and went around to nursing homes. And when I would see a patient, perhaps with a heavily decayed tooth or an older adult with a broken down tooth, the two things that would run through my head, the two questions, one, how is the tooth needed for function? And two, is there any risk that the tooth could be a source of infection or a source of pain? And by function, it could mean anything. Is the patient need this to chew? Does the patient need this to hold on to a critical partial? Or do they need the tooth for aesthetics so that when they go hang out in the dining hall, they don't feel embarrassed to be with their friends? So function can mean a lot of different things. So does it impact function? Now, is it a potential source of pain and infection? How am I gonna assess that? Ideally, two things, a radiograph, not always possible. If the radiograph's not possible, I may go tap, tap, tap on the tooth, try to move the tooth around. Does anything I do with palpation or percussion cause pain? So those are the two main things I'm, I'm looking at. And again, I know we're talking about a specific type of patient, but again, function and potential for pain and infection. Thank you. Man, you got 20 seconds left and that was an excellent answer. I mean, you can tell Sam teaches, right? Like he is an excellent teacher. And so the next person to answer this question, we have Dr. Stephanie Dickey. Hi everyone. Um, so my experience um, has been in public health practice, community health specifically. And um, this year I'm working on building my private practice um, limited to older adults and medically compromised patients, as well as um, nursing home care. Um, so I totally agree with um, Dr. Sam um, as far as function. Um, and looking at pain and infection. And, and then just to add on with that, um, especially when you're looking at medically compromised patients, um, you have to kind of see whether their uh, medical situation can tolerate um, traditional care delivery, um, um, specifically if they're going through cancer treatment, radiation, that would um, could impact whether you could remove a tooth or not at the time. Um, patients that are in hospice care, um, you know, with a shortened lifespan, um, you only have uh, so much you can do with those people just to help them um, in palliatively. Um, and severe dementia patient cases um, where you don't have access to hospital dentistry, um, those are some of the cases um, that I've specifically um, looked at using silver diamine fluoride. And then of course expense, um, what the patients can afford as well. Two excellent answers, both in a minute 22. You guys are like spot on together. You guys practiced it together, you're like twins. But another thing I'd like to add to that too is 
one of the things I think about is I don't want this extraction to be one of their last memories or like healing from this extraction to be one of their last memories. And so just as they had said before, you want to assess, is it causing them pain now? And how is that healing going to be? And where are they in life? And so I have a really cool story about a patient. All of his teeth were decayed to the gum line. He had pain. We treated him with silver diamine fluoride. Really the pain was coming from his gums more so than his teeth. Cause as Sam was talking about tapped on all the teeth, didn't have a whole lot of pain from the teeth, but when we would go to touch his gums, he had a lot of pain from his gums. The silver diamine helped with the gums quite a bit. It actually cleared up his inflammation. Wish I had before and afters. I just have afters but you can see all these little black stubs and he passed away a couple months later. So had we done full mouth extractions, he never would have fully healed and that would have been the end, but we actually decreased his inflammation and pain just with SDF. So they're, they're all good options. Our next question we have here is, are there any modifications that you make to keep an older population safe, especially now with COVID, but also that may be implemented during flu season? And again, the first person up is, Dr. Sam. Woohoo. Woohoo. So I've got to talk a little bit past tense because I'm not currently treating patients. I haven't treated patients during COVID. But when I did have my mobile dental service, I always, uh, I, I will say also, I worked alone. I may have had help from nursing home staff, but I often worked alone. And I really made every attempt to abide by all infection control measures. But I will say many times the nursing home would put me in a less than ideal place. They might put me in a cramped closet, for example, with my equipment. They might put me in a not well cleaned hair salon. And I would say if I had to make any modification, I'd stand now, I'd stand my ground and I'd say I want a more ideal place. I can say, at least in Rhode Island, and I bet in many other states, the occupancy at nursing homes is way down. Sadly, that's a combination of deaths and many people deciding, I don't want my parent to go into a nursing home, even some of the best nursing homes. So there are going to be some available rooms, and I would be pretty insistent. I want to be in a room that has windows. I want to be in a room that I can clean well. Um, so again, I, I'd stand my ground, I'd still, um, but the one thing I will add, and again, I haven't been going through this, my big concern now with older adults is communication with all these layers of masks. I don't, I'd love to hear from others, but maybe I'd buy one of those masks that people can see my mouth, but it's so difficult for older adults normally communication with the layers of masks, I think it might make it more difficult. So that's something I would definitely research. Excellent answer. I completely agree with you. There are some resources available for that. The American Mobile and Teledental Alliance, they have got a document for mobile infection control. And we'll put a link to that in the chat at the end of the course. Emma, please remind me. And then our practice website has a couple of mobile infection controls. And we've written, we've written toothbrushing guidelines for if there's an active outbreak in the home as well as if there's not an active outbreak in the home and they are a little bit different and so we'll give you the links to both of those and that may answer that question more specifically with like what mask do you use or what this do you use all of that stuff if you wanted that stuff we'll, we'll give you links to that but awesome awesome answer and I totally agree with the masks people have a harder time when they can't see your lips so the next question is how do you navigate a professional relationship with patients that are your senior? And the first person we have to answer this is Dr. Joy. So what I'd like to do is make sure that I'm calling them by Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith or Ms. Smith. I do not feel um, comfortable at the first time meeting someone by calling them by their first name. And I wait for them to say, no, please call me Liz or please call me Tom. Um, for those that are not communicative, that are in their mid to late stage of dementia, I wait and I um, will ask the caregivers what they call them, and then I will follow suit. But I never say, sweetie, honey, you know, unless I really know these particular, um, you know, these residents or these patients really well, where we've developed a relationship. Um, so that that's the most important thing that I, I will try to do is make sure that I retain the most um, utmost respect for my residents um, and no matter if they are in skilled nursing or in you know assisted living independent living 
it is always, I always introduce myself. And then I say, you know, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Smith. And then I go from there and I allow them that, you know, they will tell me what I'm allowed to call them. So that is crucial for me in beginning uh, my relationship with these, with these patients. That is an excellent answer. And it's actually something that I personally need to work on because I try to do that. And I just happen to go casual way more than I should. And I think Joy is really right because you get better results when you do that Mr. and Mrs. stuff, especially as a girl, I feel like you get better results with that. And, and I'm not very good at it. And so thank you, Joy, for saying that because I needed that reminder as well. The next person to answer this same question is Sonia. Sonia is a mobile hygienist and just an incredible hygienist. You should check out her website, the Geriatric Tooth Fairy. Like it is probably one of the cutest things I've ever seen. Thanks doc for the intro. And um, that is a great question. And I have to piggyback off um, Dr. Joy and what she said is perfect. We work with a lot of dentists in our mobile um, practice group. We have a management group and we go into over 60 nursing homes and going in, we have a team and most of the assistants and hygienists are considerably younger than the patients we serve. And I know that they feel uncomfortable sometimes. They feel, they just, I noticed that they feel uncomfortable. So we have what we call RATE and the RATE stands for respect, attention, time, and energy. You never can go wrong with respect. I don't care how old or young someone is. Respect. My mother used to always say, you can respect the dog. When you walk in the room, you can pat him on the head. That's just respect. Give them your undivided attention because majority of the time you're walking into their home. That is, even if it's a nursing home, it's their home. That's where they live. Knock on that door. Even if it's a knock on the curtain because that's their home. Give them the time. If you don't have the time, don't rush them. Just don't even approach it if you don't have the time. And that energy is so important because sometimes your smile is the only smile they're gonna get all day. So we come with positive energy. I will send someone home if you're having a bad day because this might be the last day of someone's life. And if you're having a bad day, don't bring me no trouble. So energy, and so the, we call it rate, your respect, your attention, your time, and that energy. When you give those things, and we're down south, and I'm military, so it's yes, ma'am, and, and yes, sir. And they love that. And then they'll tell you when you can proceed another way, but nothing until then. Thank you. So perfectly put. I could listen to Sonia talk all day long. And actually I did one time. She has a book out. And as a student, I know that reading books is not fun, but audiobooks are. And her book is available on audiobook. And it's called, I believe, Golden Nuggets for Life. It's a bunch of stories about her relationships with these seniors and how she developed them. So the reason I bring that up is because it's very relevant to this question. And she's actually written a book about that. And she goes through a lot of stories with that. So I, it's, it's very affordable. On I think I bought it on the Apple, whatever the Apple podcast book thing is. And, and I would recommend it's, it's a very good listen. You can listen to it all in a day. Cause I did when I was traveling down to the conference, I listened to it in the airport and on the airplane. So thank you for that. The next question that we have here is what do you do when you start to detect dementia in a patient? And the first person we have here is Dr. Stephanie. So, um, you know, if it's a patient that you've, um, been seeing over time, um, some of the things that you may notice is changes in personality, um, maybe uh, um, depression, um, loss of um, interest in life. Um, it's easier when it's somebody that you've been seeing for a while. It can be challenging more when you're first doing an intake on a patient. Um, and one of the first things that I look for is, of course, a complete in a complete medical history, I look at the medications and I look to see if there's any uh, medications um, that would kind of give away, because sometimes people won't tell you on their medical history. You actually have to see the medication. Um, if you see Aricept, um, that's a common one that um, they put people on in the early stages of dementia. And then in more moderate to severe stages, though um, you'll see mamadine. Um, but the first thing, if it's somebody that you um, haven't really worked with before, 
um, at least knowing who their PCP is and referring to that um, provider is, is very important because there's reversible causes um, of dementia and there's irreversible causes. And so knowing exactly what you're working with is very important in moving forward and caring for that patient. Excellent answer. And Dr. Dickey talked about a couple of different things with medications on there. The Special Care Dentist of Idaho put on a course, uh, we called it Geriatric Gems. Um, she gave a really great presentation with that. And I will put a link out. I've got a handout that I'm going to be sending to Emma as well that she can send to you guys that'll have links to, to people's different resources. But that's, that's a good one to learn more about the medications because I know I learned a lot from that class. We also have answering this question, Sonia. Thank you for asking the question. And one thing that we noticed that the medications are true, Doc, and thank you for saying that. But when we do notice that we're getting into early signs of dementia, we, we purposely, we all of our staff take the class where we're dementia friendly. So you have to take that class or you become dementia friendly and dementia, dementia champions. So we, we train our staff on that. And the first thing we do when we notice it is we begin to be intentional about our speaking. We speak slower and use direct eye contact when they're speaking. That is so important to make that eye contact because they may not remember what you say, but in dementia, they'll remember that experience. Mm -hmm. They may not remember what happened, but they'll remember the experience, how it made them feel. So it's important that they feel like you paid attention. Um, there's no pressure when they talk. And when you say something or you reach for them, we teach our team to count. So if I say hello and I put my hand out, if it takes them, I start counting one, two, three. And then by the time I say four, if they say hello back, that's how long it takes them to process. So at that time we've learned that. So we know it takes me to about three or four. And as we go, as, as the time goes on, you might count to 10 before they say hi back, but you wait for that high. If that high takes 10 minutes, so you don't rush them. And then we change their oral care plan. Mm -hmm. So we put pictures of the toothbrush in the bathroom. We put pictures of the toothpaste. And then if they'll allow us, put a picture of them using it. So they'll see that and remember. But here's the catch to that. You move that picture around because they'll get used to it. Like you can see a spot on your wall, women, that we need to clean. But if we keep looking at it, it just comes a part of the wall. So if that picture stays in the same place, it becomes a part of it. So we move it around behind the door, over the shower. And that's what's important, the eye contact and that voice tone. I am going to steal that from you. I love that picture idea. I've never thought about that, but that is definitely going to start in our clinics. And I love the picture of them doing it. Like totally just learned that. Awesome. So the next question is, what are some of the biggest challenges you have faced when caring for older patients? And the first panelist is Dr. Sam. Okay. So I, I would say the biggest challenge is uh, working with patients with uh, care resistant behavior. And I'm going to talk about pre tools and post tools. So I did a geriatric fellowship and I also started reading and learning more from a video I saw from Rita Jablonski. And if you ever Google or YouTube Rita Jablonski, she talks about tools that kind of like what Sonia was saying, that help reduce our being perceived as fearful. So people who uh, demonstrate care resistant behavior, they perceive us as fearful. But so let's talk before. Before I learned all this stuff, I remember I was at University of Michigan in the hospital dentistry clinic and a, uh, an adult would bring in their parent and say, oh, nobody's been able to get in my mother's mouth. And I'd say, okay, I'm going to do it. Okay, open your mouth. And she wouldn't open her mouth. She'd put her hands up. And I said, no, open your mouth. And I'd really try. Then she's fighting me. And anything I would do would make it worse. So it became really difficult. So that was a challenge. Um, so again, some of the tools I learned, this video from Rita Jablonski, uh, one thing they call it hand over hand, guiding their hand with a toothbrush, pantomime, gestures, using my voice, and definitely going low. Don't posture over them. Anything we can do to reduce our being perceived as a threat 
because the brain of a person with care resistant behavior is more on a fight or flight mode and less able to see that we're trying to help them. That is perfect. And if you have any good resources on that as well, please put those in the chat so that we can have further learning on that. Um, you did quote a couple of folks in there, and I think that that was those would be great learning for all of us. And thank you so much. I totally, completely agree. And that works for patients who have dementia. That also works for patients who have special needs. Just, I, I really like how you said, make yourself not be a threat. The next person we have answering this is Dr. Joy. So the biggest challenge that I see is communication, especially with my memory care patients, whether they're living in home, they've, they've chosen to stay in place, or they've chosen to you know, live in a um, community. Um, I recently earned my CDP, my certificate in uh, dem a dementia practitioner. Um, and that is one of the biggest things that they talk about is, is how to communicate, when to communicate, and what are you communicating? Uh, and so one of the biggest things that I try to do is make sure that I am at their level. So if they are sitting in a wheelchair, I'm going to find a chair. And if I have to go out into the hallway or down the hall to the, you know, where they have a meal, then I will bring one of those chairs over and bring it over so that we are at eye level. That is first and foremost. And I give it time. I want to make sure that I've sat down and now I'm not rushing to do the next thing. I'm sitting down, we're facing each other so we can make eye contact. And I wait for that eye contact and I'll try to make sure that we can make eye contact. I'm also a big fan of tell, show, do. Um, we learned about that for, for pediatrics. I think it's incredibly relevant for our geriatric patients as well. I'm going to you know, tell them who I am. I'm going to tell them what I'm there for. And then I'm going to show them what I'm going to be doing for them. And I completely agree with that hand over hand technique. You know, you know here's your toothbrush. You know, I put it in their hands and, and I put my hands around them. And, you know, we have a moment. Everything is with time. And I want to make sure they recognize the fact that we've done that. Um, and then we'll do it. You know, I'm going to brush your teeth. We're going to brush your teeth now. And we're going to start with that upper right side. And we will go over to the upper right side. And then I tell them what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna brush your teeth now and it's gonna be on the lower right side and I will follow in kind. So when communication is, is you know, impossible, tell, show, do is for me, a huge asset to my practice. Excellent answer. And if you don't mind putting some of the resources that you had mentioned that you were a dementia provider. Correct. Yeah. Um, if you could put some CDP. of those resources, if someone wanted to look more into becoming a dementia provider, what, what they could look at, that would be excellent to put in the chat. Thank you. You're welcome. How do you adapt dental care for patients in nursing homes and assisted living? And let me get you back to two minutes there. Okay. Yes. Well, how do we adapt it? Well, first of all, I'm not a fan of a van. I'm not, that rhymed. I'm not a fan of a van because I'm not going to take people out of their homes and, and they're already uncomfortable going from the bed to the wheelchair. And if the dentist has to do an extraction, we do kind of have to take it from the wheelchair to the jerry chair because the dentist kind of kind of lays them back on one of those floppy chairs. So we'll lay them back, but I'm, I'm not, a, I don't, not a, but I don't want to take people out in a wheelchair and put them in a van. So we have all of our small equipment and we roll in. We service people in their bed. We service people in, in a room. And what Dr. Sam was saying earlier, we are very a stickler on, on how we service people. We went into a room the other day. We waited outside with all the people waiting till they came in, vacuumed the room, scrubbed out the sink, and made the room better because we come in with our aqua filters and we kind of purify the air. So like the doctor said, we, you, we, it's kind of tight in there. You fit in where you can get in, but you can make some demands because they, are clear, they will clear the room for the podiatrist. It's something about that foot doctor. They will shut the house down for bingo. So I'm going to make dentistry just as important as the podiatrist and bingo. They'll run from that ear doctor a little bit of this case because they don't want to hear you anyway. But that podiatrist, they gonna, they'll wait in line for that. They want to get those feet scraped. So I make our dentist just as important as the podiatrist, but we take it in, we make it comfortable, we make it as clean as we can. We even set up little giveaways and have the bags at the door. We make the experience as, as, as best we can and we leave the place better than we found it. So that's how we do dentistry in nursing homes and assisted living. 
Well, excellent. And we actually have three panelists on that. And I would have to say that is my mistake. And great answer. That was not an answer she was planning on giving because I read her name for the wrong question. So that's how good Sonia is. Wasn't even prepared for that question and nailed it. So the question was actually for Dr. Sam. <laughs> my bad. Okay, so I had uh, portable dental equipment. Um, most of, some of it I got, actually most of it was from a company, Aseptico, and uh, one of, I had a delivery unit, and different than most, I had my delivery unit was separate, and then I had a long cord to a compressor that I would put the compressor in the other room just to keep the sound down a little bit. Uh, it wasn't ideal, but it was okay. I, I, again, I was working by myself. It was just sort of a, a trial thing. I had a, a Nomad, which is a portable x-ray unit. I had a, um, it was called a MyRay x-ray pod, kind of like an iPhone that you could see the, uh, films. And like I said, I would set up in an, in an area. Now the question comes, when do you provide care when the patient's in their bed? There were some times I would, especially sometimes if it, an extraction, because the nice thing after an extraction, guess what? They're in their bed. It's like, I love, I love University of Michigan football, but I would never go to Michigan Stadium because when the game is over, I got to deal with all the traffic. If I watch the game at home, when the game is done, I'm home. So the same thing with this patient, if I treat them in their bed, often it's more comfortable. But if that compromises the work I'm going to do, then certainly I'll bring them to an area where I can function my best. So I guess I would assess the procedure and determine whether it's best to do it in a nice, clean room that they've given me or the bed. So that's a little bit briefness. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent answer. And the third panelist on this, and I apologize um, that I did that, but I think you are going to get extra information and good information. The third panelist for that is Dr. Joy. So I looked at this question differently um, because I'm going into, I'm, I, as an independent contractor, I'm walking into a nursing home and um, I am not a primary care provider that the uh, family has agreed to just, you know, just by signing the contract and having that person live there. So first and foremost to me is triage. I want to make sure that I know who the power of attorney is to make sure that I am providing, that they are allowing me to provide care in the first place. And sometimes the medical POA and the financial POA are two completely different people. So these are questions that I make sure that my front desk coordinator asks when someone calls um, asking for um, treatment for one of their residents, especially if it's the director of nursing or a floor nurse or a charge nurse. Yes, I completely understand. In fact, I just had this today where um, part of a tooth on uh, tooth number seven has chipped out. And I'm like, please send me a picture. They did. Um, and I offered two suggestions of what we can do to the, to the director of nursing. And I said, but I please, I need to speak with the family because ultimately this person is in memory care. She's in late stage dementia. It is up to the family to decide what, you know, with my guidance, what we should do for this tooth. Yes, I will be coming in with my nomad. Yes, I'll be taking an x-ray to make sure there's no, you know, um, there's no infection, there's no abscess, what caused this breakage in the first place. But I wanna make sure that everyone is on board. It takes a village to make sure that these residents are being treated appropriately. And I wanna make sure I'm doing good. I'm doing, you know, uh, that the family is also in agreement as well, that they're included in the, uh, the, di the treatment for their loved one. So that's the way I looked at um, this question. Um, and, you know, privacy, 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 privacy. No, I'm not going to take care of them in the, in the reminiscence room. I'm going to take care of them in their room anymore. I, I just bring them to the room. That's what they, they know me for. And they are familiar with their home. They feel the most comfortable in their room. Excellent. The next question is, do you have any recommendations for how to reach seniors who do not have transportation or access to dental care? And that was the one I was going to ask you, Sonia. <laughs> yes, I have a huge recommendation. I am a, a fun, I'm a lover of teledentistry. Teledentistry is arms outside of the brick and mortar. I am if a, if a dentist has a brick and mortar practice, they can send their hygienist, they can send their assistant out. Now you might not always get paid for it. It depends on the state you're in, but it is a reach for people that are hard to reach, especially in states that don't have, that have rural areas. 
we were able to do a lot of access to care with teledentistry during the pandemic. We actually gave our each one of our nursing homes, it was, a, it was a cost, but it was worth it. We gave each one of our nursing homes a camera and they were able to produce teledentistry and we were able to triage and, and send the dentists out just for what they needed. So teledentistry and mobile dentistry is a way to treat people in hard to reach places. If you can get um, uh, the dental works or some one of those portable units, I'm, I'm a fan of dental works, your x-ray unit and teledentistry, you can provide some amazing dental care. That's a way to reach people that's hard to reach. If you can't arrange some sort of transportation for them, right now there's a lot of transportation going on with Ubers, getting people back and forth to dentistry. There's vans um, if the people want to come in hard to reach areas. But to me, the best way to reach someone is reaching where they're at. I tell people all the time, and that's where vans do come in at if you have to go to someone's home. Some people will never ever walk through a dental door again, but they will allow you to walk through their door. People will allow you to walk through their deal. They'll allow you to come to their home. So I do work with Cared Mobile. This a dentist. Um, he was so full during the pandemic. He was going right to people. Dr. Quan Watson out of Kentucky. He was pulling right up to people's driveway, coming out doing root canals. So all the dentists who were at home, he was building all their insurance. So the van does work for hard to reach areas. Teledentistry is amazing. Mobile dentistry, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. And I think Sonia is absolutely right with that. And that's that's one of the things that all of us as dentists and all of you guys as dental students, you want to realize the real value of having those hygienists and, and they are professionals and they are well-trained and they can go out into these facilities and they can really be your arms, you know? And so having that trust in your hygienist and being able to work with that hygienist and having that open communication where you know that they can go out there, they can gather that information that you need. They can provide some basic services for that patient. It's, it's really key. And even if all you're doing it for is before their first visit so that you can talk Talk to their caregiver and you can know what's going on and review their medical history so valuable because I can't count the times that transport has dropped somebody off at the health center I also work at a health center has dropped somebody off I've got no guardianship I have no idea what's going on and I can't take that tooth out because nobody even knows who their doctor is and that doesn't happen when your first visit is teledentistry because you are in that building and those nurses are there and if they don't know they can go ask and I will wait for it. I will wait for them to go and ask and then we will have their doctor's name, we'll have their med history. And so you have that hygienist that's in there that's willing to gather all that information for you. Then even if you don't have a mobile clinic, when that patient comes to you, you're ready. And, and being ready is awesome. So excellent, excellent answer there, Sonia. That was the one I meant for you, but you did great on both. Um, next question we have here is what advice do you have about how to educate older patients that their oral hygiene is important? And the first person we have for this is Joy. Oh, I want to ask them questions. I want to engage with them. You know, do you like your smile? You know, what do you do to help with your smile? And if they, if, if, for those that can communicate with me, um, I want to make sure that I'm asking, I'm not just telling them, I don't want to lecture. That, that's not my job. I want to have, a, I want to build a relationship with these people and I want to make sure that they feel comfortable with me. So before I even do anything with their mouths, I always want to make sure that they understand the importance of oral health. But I, I you know, I ask them, why do we brush our teeth? What are we brushing off twice a day? What's the point? You know, and then we get to the point where it's, you know, it's bugs, poop, and food, right? It's bugs, the bacterial poop, and, and a food, plaque, you know, we get into that. And they love it. Bugs, poop, and food, what? That's, I mean, I get them very excited about why we need to brush our teeth. And then we go into the how. But that is 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 crucial for me. I want to make sure that they can answer questions and we can have a dialogue. We can have a, you know, we can have, you know, a, a conversation about the importance of oral health, but but on their terms. So they can understand, you know, with by answering questions that I'm asking, you know, for their own mouth, why it's so important. Absolutely. Excellent answer. And that works for, I think, all patients too, when they're motivated to learn, you know, then, then they want to learn instead of us lecturing them. And I love the way that you put that instead of lecturing, you know, you're, you're gathering information from the patient and you're letting them come to that discovery that, yeah, this is important and I want to do it. And the next person for this question is Sonia. I got the co-sign with Dr. Joy on that because I, 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 I like the fact of asking them questions because the last thing you want to do is go to somebody that's old enough to be your great-grandmother and start telling them what they're going to do because that's how you want to get your feelings hurt. 
That's how you want to get put right in place. Listen, let me, and, and, and one of my, um, the assistants that work with her, she's going in there, ma'am, you have to do this. And she told, first of all, baby, I don't have to do anything but die. They will help you with that. So the best thing to do is ask them, hey, you know, what do you think about, you know, how do you want to clean, how do you think you should clean your denture? What do you think we should do about this dry mouth? And then they'll tell you, and then you can co-sign on that, add to that. So the best thing that I can say, especially when you're dealing with the geriatric population, is ask them their opinion because they have an opinion. And I'm going to tell you this, this is so secret. Everything is taken away from them, okay? They, they, someone tells them when they have to take a bath, when they have to eat. So to us, when we give them an option, their first thing is no, because they get an option to say no to us. So give them the option, give them the chance to, to tell you something and listen, honestly, listen, and don't just hear it, but listen to them and then talk, say it back to them, repeat it back to them that, that lets them know I heard you and then add your expertise there. And that goes over so well because that stops you from getting your feeling hurt. That stops you from hurting their feelings. And that makes them leave with their dignity and their quality of life and their pride. I'm gonna say this real quick. When I first started doing this, this man, he was an older man, a black man, very stern in his ways. And I said, let me, let me help you brush and floss your teeth. He said, I don't need you to help me do anything. I'm 80 something years old. I've been brushing my, I started crying, but that's what taught me. You don't go telling nobody 80 something years old. It's a way to approach people. That makes sense. <laughs> absolutely. That was absolutely wonderful. I completely agree with you on that. The one thing I have to add to both of those answers is the intro cameras we use for teledentistry. Sometimes showing those pictures, we've seen a lot of success in our programs with our assistants. We have assistants that go in and brush teeth in the nursing homes. And when our assistants show them on the camera, they go, is that in my mouth? And then because it was in their mouth, they're like, get that out of there, get that out of there. And so we've actually had some of our patients become our cheerleaders because they see it on the screen. So if you have an intraoral camera, don't minimize it. Don't put it in the little screen. Like their goal is to get this so that I can see it, right? Like as a dentist, I'm trying to look at it. No, put that on the full screen view and let that patient, put that so where the patient can see it. It's harder. When we're learning teledentistry, we put the camera behind the patient so that the user can learn how to use the camera. But after we're good at it, we make it so that both the patient and the operator can see the camera because that patient will see the stuff in their teeth and they want it out just as bad as you do if they know it's there. So the next question we have is, what does the first appointment with an elderly patient look like? And Joy is our first up. I'm gonna be repeating some of the answers, especially from what Sonia said, but no rushing. We take our time and we go at their speed. And if it's going to be, you know, what like, like you were saying, Sonia, about, you know, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. I never thought of it that way, but I, I sit back and I smile and I wait. And I you might, you know, might look at something else, but I am making sure that I am at their eye level. I am making sure that I only talk to them in front of them. And I make sure that I try to communicate with them where they can also communicate with me. And, and that is, I, I can't express how important that is for me. So, um, and, and once again, you know, I'm just gonna repeat myself with, with the tell show do. Um, I want them to learn about me. So I will talk a little bit about myself too, about how long I've been doing this. I get that question quite a bit. You know, how long have you been doing this? Oh, you're not old enough to be a dentist. I love them forever. Um, but yes, you know, I'll get that and, and oh, you, you can't be a dentist, you know, you're a woman. I've heard that several times. Um, so you will have that conversation too. And sometimes, you know, they might have, you know, uh, TCM on and they're watching a Fred Astaire movie and that's what they're really concentrating on. So, okay, let's, let's watch that Fred Astaire movie for a couple of minutes. You know, I've got time. Let's do it. Let's talk about the movie. I want to engage with them. I want them to feel comfortable with me because if they don't feel comfortable with me, I could give the best cleaning in the world, but they are going to resist all the way. So uh, no rushing, go, go, go with the flow and making sure that, um, that I am respecting their time because I'm walking into their life right? I'm walking into their time, their day, and they might have, you know, certain routines they like to do. Give them that grace. Well put. Did anyone else notice that when she said no rushing and go their pace that she slowed her speech down? That is self-control right there. And I wish I had it. So excellent answer. <laughs> and well, whatever you would call that. It was very well put and very well, the words were spaced out just like, oh my gosh, she's illustrating it right now. 
Um, Stephanie, you are next up with what does the appointment look like with an elderly patient, the first appointment? So my, um, the way I responded to the question um, was based more on a patient I would see in an actual, um, in my office. Um, so similar to what Dr. Joy stated, um, for me, it's all about getting to know that patient. Um, so the time I take is, um, it's, that's all that matters is how long is it going to take me to get to know that patient. Um, I don't do um, a hygiene appointment um, with that first intake. It's just all about getting to know everything um, from their social background. Are they married? Do they have kids? Do those kids visit them? Um, can they drive? How are they getting to the appointment? Are they living by themselves? Um, are they in a facility? Um, a big thing that you always need to um, look at, which Joy touched on earlier, was um, you need to know if they have a guardian um, or and who it is. If there's a financial guardian, because um, then you would need to discuss your treatment plan with that person specifically for financial reasons. But you also want to be respectful of the patient's autonomy. Um, that's a really big thing um, when you're working with older adults, especially being uh, younger than them. Um, you want to be respectful in how you ask those questions about whether they have a guardian or not. Um, but that's part of the getting to know them and being respectful, um, always referring to them as Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Um, and um, quite often, I also like to do an oral hygiene assessment as well um, and talk, see what they're able to do um, and kind of get them motivated for, um, for starting to do care at home. Excellent, excellent answers. The next question is what that you just like perfect segue here. The next question is what motivates senior patients? And since you just said, get them motivated, let's keep Stephanie up and let Dr. Stephanie say, what does motivate those patients? So I think it goes back to establishing the relationship. Um, you know, people of the older generation really um, aren't, didn't have the technology that the younger crowd has had. And so for them, conversation is really important. So I really like to focus on just getting to know them. Um, and, you know, on being an honest and um, in integrity in your treatment planning is very important as well. Um, because um, older adults really, really, um, they're giving up a lot. And quite often, they're finding themselves in um, or, you know, vulnerable situations in life. And so they want to know that they're, and the mouth is an intimate um, part of our body. And so they want to know that they're in good hands. Um, so I think letting them know that you care about them by spending that time um, is very, is a big part of motivating patients. Excellent. And next up on this same question of what motivates senior patients, we have Sonia. You know what I found out what motivates the senior patient is getting to know them. Okay, so let me give you an example. If someone has dementia and if they're, they have what they call downs, if they stay up all night and then they sleep during the day, don't come in there at nine o'clock trying to wake them up for a dental appointment. Go to lunch, come back about one o'clock and know your patient. Once you begin to know them and talk to them, they'll tell you how to treat them. Once you begin to, because some people will not talk to you at all. Some people just want you to service them. Then some people want you to talk. Some people want to have that conversation with you a long time. So I believe the best way to motivate them is to know them, get to know them. Because let me tell you this, the people who work there treat them like a job. They treat them like material. So when we come in and treat them like a human and have a whole conversation with them, they'll tell you what they like. They'll tell you what they need. So that's the way that we motivate people. And I'm going to tell you another big thing is your energy. And you can't, like I said, the, as soon as you walk in there, most of the people are on antidepressants in nursing homes. I'm just going to be honest with you in that 
nine or 10 pills that they get crushed up in that, in that pudding, they, there is some antidepressants because they don't want to be there. And a lot of people know when they check in, they, they roll out. That's their last living place. So they're depressed. So if you come in there and you, you have good energy, even if you're not all happy and bubbly, just have a peace within yourself. And if you can't reschedule that day, don't, get, don't give that to them because energy transfers. So go in there with the right attitude. You know your people, know that they like you to talk loud, like you to talk low. And I be on a roller coaster. She likes me happy. She likes me sad. She want me serious. She don't want me to say nothing. She want me to sit back. She want me to stand back. When you know people, you be up and down, but it's their house, it's their life, and it's your job. How about that? That's perfect. That is perfect. Our final question of the structured questions we have here is how can we adapt our dental offices to better cater to senior patients? And the first person for this is Dr. Sam. Okay. So there are some changes that happen with normal aging and, you know, uh, to, to, uh, for all, as we age, changes in our vision, changes in our hearing, uh, changes in our perception from our peripheral uh, um, appendages. So, uh, so thinking about that, uh, our waiting room, for example, should have good lighting for older adults. Our, uh, actually, also with vision, if you're having any materials that you're giving to patients, make sure you use a fairly decent sized font. Um, also thinking about the waiting room, you don't want to have little throw rugs that they can't perceive and could become a risk that they could trip over. Uh, also thinking about, about design again in the waiting area, you don't want to have chairs that they're going to sink into and have difficulty getting up. So, so some things like that, but equally as important as the physical in your office is how you're training your staff. Uh, in terms of communication, how your staff, all the tricks we've talked about in terms of communication, talking slowly, giving time, like Sonia said, um, make sure your staff is doing the same thing when they're making appointments, that they're not rushing the patient, that maybe they only share one thought at a time, make sure the patient has that thought. So I think training the staff effectively so that they have the communication skills and then, like I said, there's multiple things. I'm trying to think there is a good book, uh, a geriatric dentistry book that has a whole chapter about um, office design. If I can remember the name of the book, I'll, I'll tell you, I think um, it'll, it'll come to me, but um, yeah. All right, thank you. Excellent, yeah, I look forward to hearing the name of that book because you know I'll probably download it and do it on an audio book and listen to it. I got a new app on my phone that'll actually read books to me now, by the way. If it's not an audiobook and you want to read it, there's this new app. I'll, I'll put it in the in the handout that we send over to Emma because it'll take me too long to find it, but it'll actually read books to you. The next person we have to answer this, how do we adapt our office to better cater to senior patients is Dr. Dickey. So similar, um, I kind of had similar things to what Dr. Sam um, mentioned. Um, to me though, the biggest key is who you're hiring. So the front desk staff need to be people that have really good people skills and good phone skills. Um, Cause a lot of times, um, you know, the, the older adults are really, really dependent on that phone interaction, making sure that they can really get their questions answered um, and a good conversationalist um, is, as well. So I think a um, good front desk staff is so important and um, back office staff too. If you can find a dental assistant who's had experience um, working in a facility, a nursing home, um, you know, some of them are duly certified. That's very, very helpful. Um, um, so they already come with a lot of skills um, that can really help in the practice. Um, Another big thing as far as delivery of care is pillows. Um, different, there's different types of supports that you can purchase, um, but quite often you need support for the neck. You need um, back support because you're usually not treating these people, laying them all the way back in the chair. So having different types of pillows um, to accommodate and make people comfortable is so important. And finally, something that um, I like to do, because music is so important for people and it's very relaxing. 
um, I like to find out what my patients enjoy as far as music goes. And so um, when they come in, and that's kind of part of the intake appointment, and then, um, you know, I make a note in the chart, and when they come in for actual care, um, I put on, you know, whatever they're into. And um, that's just a really nice thing to help um, calm the patient and really personalize the appointment to their needs. I have found that to be so true with the music. That is absolutely, I mean, if you can put music on from when they were in high school sometimes, that just kind of takes them back and there's a lot of happiness affiliated with that. And that, some of that's pretty good music, so I like it too. But that does conclude all of the questions that you guys submitted. Um, before we jump into questions from the chat, I do wanna see if there are any of the panelists that have anything else they'd like to add. If you do have anything that you'd like to add as a panelist, please put your name in the chat. And then we'll, that way we don't all just start talking at the same time. But if anyone wants to add anything, we'll stick that in there. I'll just talk until anyone puts anything in there. And if no one does, then we'll jump on to questions. But one thing I want to tell you guys as students that is so incredibly important is to have a team of people and they don't have to be your staff and they don't have to be your team. You're looking at people on my team right here. All of these people on the panel, these are, these are some people that are on my team. I rely on everybody that you can see on this video because sometimes geriatrics is hard and sometimes you need a friend and sometimes you need a friend for emotional support. You need to call someone up. You need to talk to somebody. You had a bad day. You a patient die. You know, you, you need to have that support system, but you also need them for, oh my gosh, what is happening here? I need some clinical advice. And I remember a case that Sam had helped me on. I don't know if you remember that case, Sam, where it was like a fixed prosthetic that the both distal extensions, you couldn't clean under it. And I was like, Sam, she has dementia. What do I do about this? And Sam goes, well, there's this cool permanent soft liner. And he taught me about this soft liner. We tried it and it really improved her oral health. And so like that idea could not have come from me. And just surrounding yourself with diverse mentors, you know, dentists, hygienists, assistants, everyone had these different experiences. And so make sure that you have a diverse group of people, some that you can talk to for emotional support, some that you can talk to for clinical support, and almost all of them you can talk to for both of those things. I'd say everybody on this panel could help me in both of those things, clinical and emotional, and I need every one of them. So everybody find, find your people. I think we'll move over to Emma. If you want to start um, asking the questions here from the chat, that way we don't get lost. So the first one I got was, um, and it actually happens at our school quite a bit, and not even with um, like two older patients, but we get a lot of patients who say like, oh, what, is, what does it matter anyway? I'm going to die soon. Um, so how do you handle patients who are like apathetic about their care if every single time you try to get them motivated, like I'm going to die soon anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, like, what would your response be? I'll take that one. Um, so my, uh, my re response back is, well, we're trying to prevent you from having a toothache. We're trying to prevent you from being in pain or having any pain in your mouth. The last thing you want at this stage of the game is to, you know, have a toothache, right? I mean, you've, you've lived a beautiful long life and, and it's fantastic that you have the teeth that you have in your mouth, you know, congratulations to you, kudos to you. Let's try to maintain them as well as possible so that you don't wake up one morning with a lump or you don't wake up one morning in, you know, with a toothache, especially as an aside for us, they're on, a lot of them are on polypharmacy, right? They're on tons of medication that we, we may not be able to just say, oh, take a couple ibuprofen, right? Because they might be on aspirin therapy, they might be on gabapentin, they might be on so many different medications that are supposed to help with pain management, or they can't take anything at all. So, so that is my biggest thing. I don't want to instill fear in them, but I want them to think about the consequences of not of inaction, of not doing something. And, and that will, you know, I have, I, I get a lot of, you know, residents or a lot of my patients are kind of nodding their heads thinking about that. Oh, that's a good point. I never thought about it that way. And then I try to engage the more, have you ever had a toothache? Do you remember what that's like? Um, and going from there. And that, that has helped me quite a bit with the residents um, and uh, the at-home patients that I see. That is an excellent answer. I'd also like to add to that, that one of the things I'd like to do is if, like everybody was saying, you want to get to know your patient. You want to know their life. You want to know, you know, their, their kids. Do they have kids? Have they raised kids? And sometimes I'll relate it back to their kids and I'll say, you know, you spent all this time taking care of all these people. And now it's time that you can take care of yourself. You know, this is, it's your turn. 
and you deserve this. And I want to make sure that because some of them feel like they're being a burden on their family because their family's going to have to pay for this. And it's like, you have done all this for your kids. And I know that I know that Larry, your son would be so upset if you were not doing something that you needed. And I think Larry thinks that you deserve this as well. And we can talk to Larry and we can even bring Larry in and Larry can say, mom, you've lived a good life. You've done a great job. You deserve this. Remember when I was a kid and you did this for me? And so I think getting the family involved in that too and making sure that they that they feel like it's not a waste of their inheritance because that's unfortunately something that people do start thinking. And you wanna make sure that they know that it is their children's priority that they have good oral health. Okay, so the next question I have is at what point in your all's careers did you decide to kind of narrow your scope and um, focus on geriatric patient? I actually decided in dental school. Um, early on and it was because um, it was my freshman year and I got to go um, I was invited to a professor's home um, and he had um, a speaker who was doing mobile practice and it was the first time I'd ever heard of such a thing and so I became very interested um, in school um, but at the time there weren't a lot of options as far as um, training so um, I just started taking everything I could, every CE I saw. Um, I traveled all around the country, joined special care, um, and just have done everything I could to learn and um, ended up um, taking the master's program through USC, which was amazing. And um, so just take as much as you can. Like Dr. Brooks said, um, surround yourself with mentors um, find people that you want to practice and follow and be be like them and how they practice and uh, do it. I wanted to say I started, I've been a dental hygienist for 30 years. I've been doing geriatrics for the last, I would say 12, because when my, when my grandmother died at a nursing home, I noticed that they wasn't taking care of her teeth or her dentures. They, she had upper dentures, lower teeth, they weren't doing it. Being a hygienist, I started doing it. Then I started doing her roommate. Then I looked out the door and it was, all of them was down the hall. My grandmother was telling people, my granddaughter's a hygienist. If you give me two cigarettes, she'll clean your teeth. So I was just, she was bartering me out, pushing me around like a cheapie. But when she died, I realized that it was a need there. Now here's the deal. I have a practice manager group where I manage and we have dentists to go in. I wouldn't have been able to do this when my kids were in school because when my kids were younger as a hygienist, I was making, you guys are doctors, this is not a lot of money, but I was making about $45 an hour. I needed that when my kids were younger. The dentists that work with me in my practice, they work part-time with me because they don't make a lot of money. I'm just going to be honest. It's a labor of love. They don't make a lot of money. So it was, it was, and, and when I, with my, when my kids were in college, they're out of college, they have careers. I'm borrowing from them right now just because I, I can. I jump on their beds just because I can. They did that to me. But I wouldn't have been able to afford it when my kids were younger. So now that they're grown and I'm getting close to retirement, this is something that I want to do from my heart. So in the dentist that work with me, they have the practice. They give me one or two days a week and they do extractions and I pay them per day. So I think it's just, the, I'm being very honest because it's gotta be something in your heart, like working with kids. If you don't like kids and not, oh, that's so mean to say, everyone loves kids, right? But, but if you don't have the patience for kids, kids would know and it will bite you. You know, they feel you, they feel that energy. And it's the same with elderly people. So you have to have the patience for them. You have to be, be able to want to balance that money because there's not a lot of money in it. Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, retirement, all that money does not pay a lot of money. So that's my story and I'm gonna stick with it. Excellent story. And, and for some of you guys, you don't always decide that you're gonna go into geriatrics. I decided I wanted to go into special care when I was in dental school. I wanted to treat patients who had special needs. Well, guess what? I live in rural Idaho. And so everyone that has any kind of behavioral disturbance, no matter what it is, they're gonna come see me because I see patients who have neurodevelopmental disabilities. And so then all of a sudden I started getting all these patients who had dementia. Well, because I run a hospital practice, some of these patients were too medically complex to be able to take into the hospital. So then I had to think, well, what can I I do. So then I started this mobile practice because I was like, well, you know, I have a firm believer that your environment will affect your behavior. 
And so I thought, well, if I can go into their environment, then maybe I'll get better behavior because I sure can't take them to the hospital because that might be their very last thing they do. And I don't want that to happen, but they have this problem we need to solve. So, so that's how I got into it. I didn't even, I don't think I decided, I think it was decided for me that there, there's, there was just this abundant need and no one to take care of it. And I was the special care dentist. So everybody just said, oh, well, yeah, geriatrics. Oh yeah. Well, you know, all of these, I've also learned a lot about mental health issues and drug abuse because all of those patients were not what I was trained for. I was trained for neuro neurodevelopmental disabilities, but when you have that niche and you're in a rural area, that niche becomes a lot bigger than a niche. For me, uh, just really quickly, my grandmother needed a new lower partial denture and horrible sciatica. So I went to her house, made her another lower, I made her a lower partial denture. She went to church and just like you, Sonia, she was telling everybody in the world at her, at her senior ladies guild that I go into people's homes. So I get a phone call the next day. Well, first my aunt called to warn me about this, God bless her. So then the next day I get a phone call and the granddaughter was calling um, the grandmother really quickly, stroke victim, um, non-communicative for two years, widow, ha horrible smell coming from her mouth. And they couldn't understand why they were brushing her teeth twice a day because she was very concerned always about the way she looked and how she presented herself. I went to the house, we figured something out. I went over there with like, you know, a basic setup and I, and I didn't really know what to bring. Um, and no one, I mean, but if you think about it, she had a stroke, right? So she was in a hospital. She had all those caregivers at the hospital. Now she's at home and no one decided to look, to lift up the upper lip or lower the lower lip. She was completely edentulous. She had a full set of dentures they were brushing her dentures. Now, let me tell you, these were gorgeous dentures. She paid a pretty penny for those premium teeth, let me tell you. But no one looked. The, the caregiving agency at home, no, because we don't know what we don't know. They, no one knew that these, this person was, you know, was completely without teeth. And that was my aha moment. I'm like, oh my God, this is my calling. This is what I have to do. And I will say though, that, you know, I do this two days a week, but I have a brick and mortar practice that I do Invisalign and I, and I treat families. You know, I had four kids, you know, my last, my last four patients today were, were kids. And, her, and their mom. So I do have my, you know, that, that's my, that's my bread and butter. That's where I'm making the money. But my true passion is my two days a week that I so look forward to go out into the community and not only provide care for these residents, but also educating anybody I can possibly get my hands on to bring into the room and say, this is what I see. This is what we need to do about it. So that's my story. So I'll add my, not to be, Outdone. So kind of like Stephanie, I had an interest in working with older adults when I was in dental school, but it was when I had my first job after my residency, I was working at a community health center four days a week and one day a week I kind of had free and my mother's best friend, Mrs. Rosen said, hey, Jewish Home for the Aged is just down the street. They actually have a dental chair. They don't have any dentist to work there. If I'm your dental assistant, will you come and work? So Mrs. Rosen, who I knew my entire life, she twisted my arm. We just had fun with the patient. She knew the patients. Many of them, to be honest, were Holocaust survivors. And I felt like just honored to be in their presence. And, um, at the end of the day, I just felt lifted by helping people I just deeply honored. And the other thing, I, I, we may have discussed this, but ask your patient questions, learn a little bit about their lives. You may see an older adult and assume they haven't had a life, but let me tell you, they've had lives. Once you know about their life, it's gonna just raise, you feel so honored to work with them. I remember I was working uh, with a patient, African-American older woman who was, you know, very quiet. I asked her what she did. She told me that she sewed uniforms for soldiers during World War II. And I was like, oh my God. And when I heard that, I was like, I just felt like honored to be in her presence and even more honored to be helping her. So that was, that was what started me. Um, the next question we had is for people who are interested in getting into the field of geriatric dentistry, what resources do you recommend reaching out to for like volunteering jobs, um, just different opportunities that someone might have, um, to get involved. I think joining the special care dental association is really important because you meet a lot of people 
that have that same passion. Um, and it is a calling. Um, it's not for everybody. And um, you need to find people that, you know, you can feed off of that have that same desire and motivation. Um, it's hard work. Um, in a lot of ways, it's physically hard on your body some days, especially if you're going into facilities and working with patients in their bed or in their wheelchair. Um, it's emotionally difficult at times. Um, you know, a lot of us that work with this population, we lose our patients and um, that impacts us and our staff. And it's something not that we all in dentistry lose our patients, but if you're mostly focused with an older adult population, you are going to lose your patients. And sometimes you have to have difficult conversations with them about end of life care and um, things like that. So um, I think surrounding yourself with people of the same mindset, um, special care is a great, um, a great place to start. That's where I actually met Dr. Dickey. She practices three hours away from me. And I think I met her. I don't remember what town we were in Atlanta or something. I don't know where we were, but we met each other at the special care dental association annual session. And it's like, Hey, you practice in my state. And yeah. ever since she's been such a great mentor to me because she is educated in geriatrics. The networking's amazing. I mean, it took me going to a special care dental association meeting clear across the right. country to meet someone who practiced three hours away. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say, I've always been a big advocate of GPR programs. You don't, you don't have to do it, but the one thing I'll say is that they really vary. Some of the geriatric dentistry programs focus on younger special needs patients. Some of them, especially like the VA programs, you, you're gonna treat a lot of older adults. So um, it's a, a GPR is a great transition from dental school where you're totally supervised to private practice where you, you have nobody and you make great connections uh, in a GPR program as well. Um, so one of the students that was watching, he actually has a girlfriend who's an occupational therapist at assisted living facility. And I think she has noticed there that every patient who gets referred for um, recurrent urinary tract infections don't brush their teeth um, and haven't had any type of oral hygiene or um, you know professional care done in a while. And so um, do you have any experience or um, any kind of relationship that you guys have seen between the role of oral hygiene and um, UTI prevention and then even educating like the staff there for situations like that? I can take this one uh, to start off with. Um, yes, there's absolutely a direct correlation between that. Bacteria um, likes to travel, they migrate. Um, I say that they, there's overcrowding in the mouth and they, they will leave the mouth and, and find other places to, to live. I also see too, that patients would put it, be put on antibiotics for something and then they get a UTI. Um, there's a direct correlation between being on antibiotics, especially long-term antibiotics um, or heavy antibiotics. Um, they will tend to get UTIs as well. Um, so yes, Absolutely direct correlation. The mouth is connected to the rest of the body uh, and vice versa, right? The, the body is connected to the mouth. So what you can see happening in the mouth, you can definitely see, uh, it could definitely translate to a different part of the body. Um, and then do, uh, do I have any experience with the role um, in preventing and educating staff? I beg, borrow, and steal. I try so hard to make sure I am collecting business cards at that front desk of the nursing homes of every single person that has a business card. And I am reaching out to them and I'm saying, hi, I was here to see Mrs. Smith because the family found me online and, and I saw Mrs. Smith for, and I, I, this is a beautiful facility and I would love to help out in providing a lunch and learn. And I will be there for the, the, the three different shifts. And, and, and I'll be there for an hour and I will talk about the difference between crowns and, and bridges and bridges and dentures because in, in, unfortunately in a nursing home community, bridges and dentures are synonymous. They mean the same thing and we know differently, correct? And so they, once again, they don't know what they don't know. They're not educated. The certified nursing assistants are not being taught you know, appropriate amount of oral health. The directors of nursing, um, they've got a lot on their hands. They have to deal with a lot of stuff. And so oral health, unfortunately, is not really a priority. Um, there is something called activities of daily living, dentistry, brushing the teeth twice a day is not mentioned in the activities of daily living, which is a kind of like a federal, for lack of a better word, federal guideline 
of what should be done for residents that can't take care of themselves. And um, brushing teeth, um, oral hygiene is not listed there. So this is something where, you know, I try to bring up to their attention, bring to their attention. And I will, I'm not gonna say I'm a pest, but I will email and then connect with them online through, at least I try to on LinkedIn. And then I will then, it, you get the idea. Um, it is, it is, once again, it's not just getting the respect of the residents, but it's also getting the respect of the people that work there as well. That is crucial. If you show it, and if, if you can make that one resident happy, you know, and that family happy, the, the word spreads like wildfire in the community, um, regardless if it's independent living to skilled nursing, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if you can create that really good relationship with that family and say, you know, hey, I helped Mrs. Smith, would love to explain why, you know, her denture kept coming loose. Um, that is a really good way of um, being able to then be accepted into the community as a resource to provide uh, an oral care um, you know, lunch and learn, so to speak. Um, thank you guys for, you know, donating your time to us. It was really helpful. <laughs> I definitely learned a lot, so. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you. Anyway, I want to wish everybody a good night. It's, it's sleepy time here in Rhode Island. So. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet it is sleepy time. Well, thank you for being here. I very much appreciate you. Thanks. Bye -bye. And, and from Chicago, I'm signing out, but I did put my email on there, jvpdent at gmail. That's my personal email. Please feel free to contact me at any time. It would be an absolute pleasure to discuss anything with anyone. So thank you.